Welcome to ThinkTech Hawaii's new show, Human Humane Architecture, which is uh, dealing with that here in Hawaii, the uh, natural environment should be in tuned and synchronized with the built environment uh, and vice versa. So um, I'm going to facilitate this, this topic for the next uh, couple of weeks or month. And my name is Martin Despang. I'm a, an architect and also an educator. And so today is the kickoff of the show. So my uh, dream guest for kicking this off is, <laughs> is, an, is a colleague of mine, it's Mr. Les Wallach, who is a internationally practicing and uh, renowned uh, architect who's awarded with many awards and published. What impressed me always the most was you made the cover of the Wallpaper magazine, which also saw in your office. And you're based in Tucson, Arizona where we had the chance to get to know each other and spend two years together. And you've worked all over the world. You're working all over the world. Uh, I always brought you in to talk about your work in China, which I find very impressive, how you keep the ethical standards, the integrity of the design, uh, that being rather challenging. But uh, today, with all these things, we want to talk about something that has to do with Hawaii, because that's what the show is, is about. So uh, you came from France, actually, more recently. You spent uh, a couple of months, actually really a couple, two months uh, in France. But so you're mostly in Tucson and all over the world. Uh, you're, uh, f I should say, frequently in Maui and you're occasionally here in Honolulu. So we're very, very privileged to have you here, Les. Thank you very much for being here with us. It's my pleasure, Martin. And uh, I really had a hard time because of all the projects you have done, and uh, we will uh, show the, the website at the end. Your firm's name is Line and Space. Um, I hope the audience is going to check that out and see that amazing sort of range of, of work from residential over, over civic and commercial and, and um, throughout the whole range, amazing work. So today we're probably going to show one of the smallest projects. But especially, uh, and no doubt for us in Hawaii, the most relevant project. And uh, Zuri uh, is going to walk us through, and she already brings what you said is the most important drawing or diagram of that project she already has, has up on the screen. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your project, Les? Okay, it's a pleasure. Uh, in a way, there's actually another slide I would rather have started with, which is our tent deck underneath the, underneath the uh, Indian rain tree. Mm -hmm. And because we camped on the site many times to, to uh, understand the mm -hmm. environment and how the, how the uh, breezes worked and the rain worked and so forth. Uh, it all started like 25 years ago when we went camping in Wayanapanapa State Park and that led us to a, a love affair with Hana. Mm -hmm. And so we had been coming here for 25 years. Eventually, we found a piece of beautiful piece of land on the coast, which was unusual to be able to, to afford. And we were able to work it out. And so we um, started building there. First, we built a tent deck. My wife and I built a tent deck, like I said, to be up out of the, out of the rain mm -hmm. and get breezes below the deck. Mm -hmm. And then uh, sighted the house, as you can see from this picture, uh, it's nondescript from this is the view from the highway and the idea was that it's to be a private place and we don't need people on the highway to know one thing or another about the house and also in fact this is the north elevation so the breezes come in the east and west are uh, on right and left and the breeze it's set up so you can make out that there's a, a louver there's a glass corner and then there's a louver there and that louver controls the trade wind coming through the house mm -hmm. and there's one on each side of the house one side of the house the the diagram is very simple there's two bedrooms there's a bedroom and an office and the office doubles as a guest room and then living in the middle of that mm -hmm. so um, I've over the years I've done a lot of work and I go to China from here from Hana it's uh, it's great it's very inspirational just to look at that view and design a new new project in China. Mm -hmm. so. And you also call it the official name of the project is actually the HANA Environmental Design Studio, right? 
So it's a live-work yeah. combination, right? Yes, it's so. a live-and-work. Um, this picture's interesting because it's the, the deck that comes around the house. Um, is, that's where, where our dining is outside there. Uh, the chairs you see there are from a store called Ikea. My wife assembled them and sanded them. And so it was a, this was a total family project. Our son, my wife, and I, and friends from Tucson and some local people uh, built this house over three or four years of construction. That piece of glass, I purchased all the glass in China. Mm -hmm. And from a glass company I got to know, and they did the engineering of the glass for me. And um, the one piece of glass came miscut. They're cut at the angle of the roof from the parallel sides, and it was off by a few inches. And so, you know, being an architect, Martin would have done the same thing. It's like a piece of glass table, you mm -hmm. know, just, it just designed itself. Mm -hmm. And when people impale themselves on the sharp corner, I just say, hey, you know. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So let's be sort of critical or devil's advocate, I guess. Um, so. Here in Hawaii, for the demand we have, we don't have you know enough building material left uh, to build with. So usually there's this sort of almost nostalgic desire to say build from scratch. You come from from Tucson, so Adobe and Rammed Earth, our colleague Rick Joy has sort of popularized you know the uh, the the Rammed Earth sort of methodology. You've done work with that material as well. But as we talked before we walked over here and we're out in the sun, we said thermal math is really, really something to avoid in the, in the tropics. So talk a little bit about your, your sort of tectonic, your material uh, strategies, because we have an apparent problem on the islands, which is sort of the, um, the, the lack of av availability of material. And at the same time, we have very high labor costs. So both together uh, hardly allow people at all to get anything built. And if they get something built, they basically become victims of certain standards. They're pretty much uh, the American, the, the generic American standard of stick frames. Hawaii, a research project with me that you had a piece of thermally modified timber buried in your ground for a while and gave it to me back after two years, I think. So Hawaii uh, had sort of, um, embraced or, or welcomed certain things that it didn't want to, and one of them is termites, right, for yeah. example. So Especially the Formosan termite, yes. So if you build a house here out of stick frame, which is actually the predominant way one is still building here, you got to have every 10 years or so, you got to wrap your whole house with a tarp and you poison it. So there are all these things, and now you're very uh, environmentally uh, conscious person, you're also a very health conscious person. So talk a little bit about these aspects, how they informed your choice. Well, it, it's material. a frame house, so like Martin was saying, thermal mass is, is caused a lot of problem in, in being able to have thermal comfort because it holds heat and doesn't, it, the, it doesn't cool down very fast. So it, it's causing a heat lag. So in, well into midnight, you're still getting heat from the walls. So we, we, uh, did very light walls. The whole house is frame and it's built up above the ground to get breezes below and above to keep it cool. Um, one of the things about the, the stick frame, which we used a lot of lumber, is that um, it's all treated with boracare, which is a borax mm -hmm. uh, based uh, termite treatment, which works well with, with termites and it's not, uh, it's not a problem with being poisonous to humans. Mm -hmm. The one problem is the water soluble, so during construction you can leach out all the bore care. Mm -hmm. So what we did was, as the lumber came onto the job, we painted it, mm -hmm. and that sealed the, mm -hmm. the bore mm -hmm. care in. Mm -hmm. So everything yeah. was, was painted and sealed. That's great. Yeah. No, because borate is pretty much a silicate and that sort of salt. For me, this is interesting to maybe reinvent some of the indigenous uh, practices. And basically, some of the houses that were built back in the days were done with wood from another island. So they were floating the wood through the, through the ocean, through the Pacific Ocean. And that basically, we call that seawater curing, which is basically what the salt did to the wood. And that's one interesting research strand with a thermally modified wood that you basically close the cell. So it cannot leach out anymore, so it's sort of for this sort of further research. But, and the other part is, I think, maybe this sort of, sec, uh, this sort of sweat equity part, right? That you basically cut out the problem of 
cost of labor by building it yourself with with your friends, right? Yeah, we we built a lot of the house. We prefabricated the parts in in Tucson, and actually when we when we were able to, we shipped a small container out with the kitchen cabinets and all that kind of thing. So we built them in our garage at home and just filled it with drawers and mm -hmm. headboards mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. beds and everything else we could think of making. And so that worked out quite well. It was a family affair in the sense that Susan became very, very excellent at tying rebar and our son was a you know, forced labor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You also had our very dear friend Alvaro Malo involved, yeah. right? Yeah, the director of architecture in Tucson is a very precise guy, so he seemed perfect to adjust all the drawers mm -hmm. on our mm -hmm. cabinets so mm -hmm. that they would came mm -hmm. out perfectly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this sort of traces directly back to the beginning of your firm where you actually started off as a design build firm, right? Yes. Which is also the project that got you famous in China and got you in business in China, right? Because one of your clients basically saw one of these houses that you basically designed and built with your team. Yes, a, a Chinese architecture magazine profiled our firm and included in that, like Martin said, was this one project that this particular uh, Chinese group really enjoyed. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we've had a nice tenure, even though I swore that I would never work for a developer. Mm -hmm. and I stuck to it for about 25 years in Tucson. This, this group came out to see us in Tucson. They were so compelling mm -hmm. that we decided to do it. And 10 years later, we just got in, now we're just doing a uh, zero discharge boutique hotel mm -hmm. on a very mm -hmm. fragile site. Mm -hmm. they, they choose us for that kind of mm -hmm. project. And maybe for the audience that is not so much into our terminology is that basically means net zero, right? Yeah, so. net zero. So in other words, there's no sewage discharged. Everything is composted. There's no rainwater discharged off the site. It's collected mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and re recy recycled. Um, there's no trash whatsoever that comes off of it. For a nice, for a little hotel, that's a very, very nice way to go into a fragile site. Yeah, and we, we're going to take a short break here and then we're going to pick up from there because when you talk about resort and tourism, this is what we're run by here on the island of Oahu or the islands of Hawaii. So let's talk about that after the short break. Aloha everyone, I'm Maria Mera and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show Viva Hawaii every other Monday at 3 p.m. Um, we are here to show you news, issues and events local and around the world. Join me. Hi, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. I'd love you to join us every week, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. for Ehana Kako. Let's work together. We report every week on the good things going on in our state, as well as the better things that can go on in the future. We have guests covering everything from the economy, the government, and society. See you Mondays on Ehana Kako at 2 o'clock p.m. Until then, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. So welcome back to today's show, Human Humane Architecture, with our guest Les Wallach, who talks about his HANA environmental uh, design studio, which I, by the way, uh, sort of allowed myself to title a little differently, and it's called Les's Line and Space Lanai. And as good friends are allowed to agree to disagree, <laughs> uh, you shared with me that you would have uh, phrased one of the words differently, right? Do you want to share that? Uh, uh, what was that, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting point because um, it's the it's the last word of lanai. You say you actually prefer to call it a deck. Oh yeah. Well, that's a terminology I happen to be used to. Yeah. I think that's very charming because you're obviously a holly as I am. So you're obviously not trying to make this uh, uh, sort of look um, sort of nostalgically local or sound nostalgically local. You basically approach it as all your projects very rational and you mm -hmm. think about the very specifics of the location and climate being an, an important part of culture. Yeah. And basically said that approach, will that sort of automatically res be respectful of, of local sort of desires and also sort of um, feelings. 
Well, you know, obviously in the different places we work, and particularly in China, it comes up a lot. How are we be culturally in tune? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, essentially, the idea is that there, there's two main components to finding out what you need to do. Mm -hmm. One is the program, which are the essential needs of the project. What does the client, or in this case, what do my wife and I and son need to function? And the other is the site and how the site dictates how the building will sit on the site. The sun is, is, tells you how to orient the house. The view, sometime in conflict with the sun, also tells you, I mean, how to orient because that is crucial to the enjoyment of the house so mm -hmm. they can blur the distinction mm -hmm. between inside and outside. In our case, it's, a, it's a, not a tiny house, but it's not a giant house, mm -hmm. including the office. It's about 1,500 square feet. Mm -hmm. But the, the deck, or as Martin likes to call it, the lanai, is about 1,100 square feet, almost a one-to-one -one ratio. Mm -hmm. So it's not, and the roof is much bigger. Mm -hmm. The roof hangs out well past the lanai, mm -hmm. and it's, it's kind of common to our projects. Mm -hmm. Often the roof is twice or three times bigger than mm -hmm. the floor area of the mm -hmm. building. Mm -hmm. Now here in this, in this particular diagram, one thing that one sees, those red arrows, the blue is, uh, is air coming in, and where the yellow is by the, the, the cartoon person is a continuous slot vent. And there's a, like a four to six inch space above the ceiling that exhausts by, by convection, one of the ways of heat transfer, one of the three ways of heat transfer, convection follows the slope of the roof and goes out through another uh, exhaust, a continuous mm -hmm. stainless steel wire exhaust that's uh, 70 feet long mm -hmm. and about a foot and a half wide. So it exhausts the air out very, very well. And so we that's- call a, that a cool roof? You could call it a cool mm -hmm. roof, yeah. It's a convective roof, yeah. And it's very cool. It Literally and figuratively. It works. <laughs> it works well. Yeah, yeah. And so it does get a little chilly sometimes, even in the summer. And mm -hmm. there, when the when the uh, trades are blowing, you can feel like, hmm, I think I need to put another shirt on or something mm -hmm. like that. And at night, we definitely sleep under blankets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and our next door neighbor has told us how how hot it is, and we're saying, well, you know, their house was built a long time ago and didn't take these kind of things into account. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe you're sort of provocative without trying to be provocative because you're not that kind of personality, but the product is provocative in terms of the building doesn't show any chevron symbols, no Polynesian ornaments, right? But yet um, it is a very Hawaii building. Well, I'm trying to avoid to say Hawaiian because that's a different thing, but it's a very Hawaii building. We, you know, we like to think that we do architecture of its place. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other main element is of its time, mm -hmm. time and place. Mm -hmm. Those are key words in the sense of describing a, f a philosophy mm -hmm. of architecture. Mm -hmm. So if you're not trying to do kitsch, which a lot of architecture is uh, when it starts to try to look like little grass huts and it's you know, a 10 story building, um, then you think time and place. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And that gets us directly to when you say in a tall building that um, maybe the audience could say, you know, this is, uh, this is still sort of uh, not addressing the problems we're facing on the islands, which is affordable housing, which is homelessness, uh, which is uh, transportation. All these things are maybe not directly addressed, but I think what you try to get across and what the building does is that the principles you're basically applying yeah the applicable to other typologies? Definitely, this is the ideal place for uh, uh, natural climate control. Mm -hmm. Natural breezes, we're, we're thankful to have trade winds here that are pretty consistent. Not always perfect, but for the most part, yes. Yeah. And uh, when you mostly reside in, in Arizona, which I had that experience too, where the climate is significantly different uh, you got the time lag of, of cold nights and, and hot days, and that leads to thermal mass is actually an ideal building material here and sort of a vernacular way of building. 
Um, how, how do you feel about Hawaii? I mean, when we drove here and I was addressing all the challenges, not to say problems, you uh, said, Martin, I try to not look at that anymore because it just makes me, that's, you didn't say that, but that's how I felt, you kind of meant it. So, so positively speaking, what be, would be your advice for the islands um, as far as sort of maybe even building codes? We will have a good friend and, and, and host, uh, co-host Howard Wig uh, on one of the shows coming up, and he's the, the advocate of um, actually uh, sort of adjusting, refining the international building code that Hawaii has unfortunately adopted a while ago. That is basically then sort of even sort of code-wise officializing, making hermetic billing. So it's trying very hard to bring it back, you know, crafting an appendix that allows all the natural systems that are so specific. So, so you have some recommendations along these well, lines. Well, one thing that's quite different from the desert here, you have the the vast ocean that's a mitigating effect, and so the diurnal temperature changes are not as extreme as Martin had said there where in the desert, of course, it can get 40 or 50 degrees difference between the daytime temperature and the nighttime temperature. But still a couple of those principles, when Martin kind of turned my head and forced me to look at a certain building, I was thinking, you know, it was a big, it's a big mistake using cast in place concrete frames that really dominate the thermal mass of a building. But one thing that, that can be done uh, is to reverse insulate the building. So in other words, the insulation put on the outside of the building ins and that thermal mass then is used to, to affect kind of a flywheel effect and you open the building at night it takes a certain amount of management and the, the, the those big thermal walls become heat sinks mm -hmm. of course as you, everyone knows heat is what moves heat flows to a place with less heat mm -hmm. so if the walls cool and you're hot mm -hmm. your heat goes to that wall mm -hmm. and you feel cooler mm -hmm. That's radiant cooling, yeah. So for the last seven minutes left that we have, I want to maybe talk a little bit more about the, if we say architecture is arts and sciences and they inform each other, and I think we have talked a great deal about the science, which I think is incredibly important here to educate uh, the, the larger public about it. But um, also, I sometimes my students watch these uh, watch these shows here, and uh, for me, it's tremendously important to say, you know, science alone doesn't do it, doesn't cut it, right? A building that's just, you know, performing well. Well, if you look at you look over Martin's shoulder there, or my shoulder in this case, there's the, the, the columns are split in two. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to be split in two, mm -hmm. but I felt that that would be that I would enjoy ha splitting the columns in two. It allowed me to use a slightly less mass in the columns, mm -hmm. but it also gave me the opportunity that the cross pieces that come across then become lights. Mm -hmm. And so at night you get a beautiful light and a shadow coming down the column. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the art of the column. That's interesting because if you look, and you hadn't explained it that way because that's not your mindset, but if you look at indigenous architecture, they have built in a bony way you know, with members, and they often, you know, multiply them. So this is, in fact, something that, that again, you don't sort of mimic, you don't fetishize as kitsch. Right. So it's not about sort of the image of that or the illusion of it. It's basically sort of, I will say it's, it's evolutionary. You just look at, you know, um, you're, you're certainly aware of these, of these sort of, of this heritage but you reinterpret that from your from your local perspective that you have. Right. We will have uh, Bill Chapman coming up in in one of the shows, and his show will be called "How the Architect." So I would I would most respectfully call you that 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 you come from another place, come to this place, you're blown away by it as most people. You have utmost respect, and that leads you to act very respectfully, right, uh, with the economy of means with the material, with the space you create. And just to be more, more explicit for the audience, it, it is a building that is not using air conditioning. It uses the trade winds basically to condition itself. You can see how it completely opens up to the outside. So when we're talking about blurring the distinction between inside and outside mm -hmm. space, which of course is not an original idea, but kind of a philosophy among quite a group of architects, mm -hmm. uh, it allows you just to move seamlessly between the inside and the outside, mm -hmm. both visually and 
in your living. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we eat, we think we don't say we're going to eat outside. We just go to the table, mm -hmm. which is outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it protects you from the elements as the rain and the sun. And that's yeah. what architecture's main purpose of shelter has always been doing. Uh, it's, it's interesting, uh, at the very beginning, go, go back sort of full circle at the, fr at the show here that you started with a sort of very blank, almost, try to want to say hostile, but that's how some people would actually say this is not even, there's no house. There's a because shed. Because they don't, they just see a shed. Yeah, yeah well, that's what it is. And they see, they see corrugated metal, which is not the, a material that's conceived to be traditionally beautiful. You know, this is, it's, it's very sort of rugged. It's very almost industrial, you can say, right? But it's very utilitarian at the same time. So I, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the Hawaiians with their thatched roofs, that was also very logic, very utilitarian. Only then cultures later on perceived it in a romantic, nostalgic way, right? So I would say your house is very much in the tradition of these original ways of building and space making. Well, one kind of important idea that, that a lot of people could adopt is that as you're looking at the, towards the tree there, the roof extends substantially farther than the, the deck, than the mm -hmm. lanai. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons those columns are angling like that, is to pick up the additional load of a roof that's bigger than the deck that's below. Mm -hmm. It all makes sense when you think about it that way. But it's like a big umbrella there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much, Les. We're reaching the end of the show, and I would allow myself to call this house a case study house because there's this sort of legendary case study series in uh, California at the West Coast uh, by Joe Intenza. And uh, I very much see your building sort of in this tradition of making something out of out of nothing almost. <laughs> and. Uh, so thank you very much. I think this is an important lesson and uh, should be a great encouragement for some people who are maybe thinking doing something uh, likewise, that going back to the working title of the show, Walking the Talk, it is possible. And thanks for the encouragement and hope to have you back on another show because so much more to talk about. But thank you very much for this awesome beginning. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Les. So. So uh, see you all back, hopefully, next week on Tuesdays, 5 o'clock. It's Humane Human Architecture in Hawaii with Martin Despain. <laughs>